If I was, I was in practice for, for many years, as, uh, as Jaji pointed out, in the Memorial Hermann system. I was at the Southwest campus practicing infectious disease. And we used to have a, uh, I think it was monthly, a medical informatics committee, MIC. And this is where I, Dr. Murphy, who uh, was our CMIO for the Memorial Hermann system, we would have these meetings. We were not yet up on electronic medical record in the hospital, but we knew it was coming. And this was, you know, this was uh, early to mid-2000s, and we knew it was coming. And, and I learned a lot, um, but I realized I didn't know anywhere near as much. When I entered into the hospital administration world, all I was hearing from the nurses were, well, you know, we would be having a much better task of doing this if it was only IT, because they just don't get it. And I was like, mm, okay, let me talk to the IT people. And they would say, you know, we built it for the nurses just like they asked for it. They don't know what they want. That's the problem. And so I realized you really have to have people who can speak both languages. So I realized I really needed to, to get some more information. So I looked around and found that there was, in fact, a, a you know, well-regarded uh, informatics school. It was the School of Health Information Sciences, for those of you who've been around a few years. It was SHIS before it was SBMI. And I originally enrolled just to take a few courses and get a certificate, and then I realized this is an unbelievable field that I knew nothing about. Um, every chapter was, in fact, just one little piece of, of an enormous field. It's sort of like the tips of, uh, of Lena Sea and Island from the air, and you realize that's just a little, you know, a few square miles, and you realize it's on top of an 8,000-foot mountain, undersea mountain. So that's kind of the way informatics was for me. So I went and got a master's degree, and you know, the rest is history. But I wanted to mention that. Um, so this is actually, uh, turns out to be old data. I got this last week from the ONC website, the Office of the National Coordinator, and it only goes up to January of 2012, those of you who are up, up close. But you can see that from when the, the big bucks became available for hospitals and for physicians' offices, uh, the meaningful use. This was a $27, $28 billion incentive to put electronic health records into hospitals and doctors' offices. Huge increase. And this is actually a health IT implementation, the blue part, the support guys, the IT, quote-unquote, that I was talking about. And then there's the clinical users in red. You can imagine if we extended this to modern times where it would be given, given our school's incredible rise in just the last two, three years. It's not even on this grid. So again, you can see that all of those people need to have some sort of a governance, and that's kind of where the CMIO comes in. And in, in just a minute, we'll talk about it. Next, please. And this is just, you know, this is uh, all uh, online health jobs. You can see it's going up. Next, please. Um, and then this is just the percentage of all jobs and a percent of healthcare jobs, and it's really doubled in just a few years. And again, I think it's accelerated even since these slides were, were put together by the ONC. Next, please. So what is the CMIO not? Okay, we are, we are, we are, and Dr. Murphy would back me up on this. We were chatting a little bit before we got started. We are not the guy you call when you drop your iPhone or your laptop breaks or your, you know, password reset. We are not any of those things. And so, you know, we're, we're not those people and we are not MORDAC. Next, please. If those of you don't know who MORDAC is, MORDAC is the preventer of information services. Um, you know, security is more important than usability. In a perfect world, no one would be able to use anything. And to complete the login procedure, <laughs> stare directly at the sun. I think, I think many of us know a MORDAC. We probably have MORDACs in your various different organizations. There's a MORDAC everywhere who thinks that the best information is stuff that only they have access to and everything else, you're going to abuse it. You know, we can't trust you with the information. Next, please. So what, what do we do? And we're, we really are as we're a liaison. We speak that clinical language. We, we speak the sort of the informatics part, the actual information management part. And, and those really are very distinct. Anyone, who, if you've tried to implement a major project like putting a health, uh, electronic health record in a hospital, you realize it's not just plugging in the computer and saying, okay, go ahead and use it. It's, it's way more complicated than that. If you do that, you are absolutely doomed to fail. And there's been some spectacular failures over the years in various parts of the country about places that didn't take a lot of things into account. You know, it's bi-directional communication. We have to be able to talk to physicians. We have to be able to talk to, to chief nursing officers, chief medical officers, to CEOs. And at the same time, we also have to be able to talk to, you know, clinical colleagues. We have to have some credibility that, yeah, you actually know my problem because, you know, you were you know, you were a practicing doctor, you understand what I'm talking about. Um, you know, we, again, workflow, these are things that 
if you don't take these things into account and you just put the computer in front of the doctor and you say, well, you know, when do you want me to do this? Before I see the patient, after I see the patient, during, I'm going to take the computer in the room. I mean, if you don't think about a lot of this stuff, you're, you're just doomed to failure. Um, and then finally, user acceptor testing. Once the software comes out, you got to make sure it works. And, and it, you know, whether something works for the IT person means it's there. It, if it doesn't matter, it takes you a while. It doesn't matter, you got to go through 14 different clicks to get to where you're at. Well, it works, doesn't it? I mean, it gets, I mean, you get the answer right, and it's like, well, no, you don't quite understand that if it's not instantaneous, the doctor's going to get mad and throw a chair. And the next, so the next slide is, uh, so we're the consume, customer relationship management. What that means is when the doctor gets upset and storms into the CEO's office or starts uh, throwing a fit up on one of the floors, who do you think they call? You know, they call, oh, could you go talk to that doctor and calm them down and tell them how to use the system? And so there's a lot of hand-holding of, of our colleagues. Um, and I'm not going to go through all of this in the interest of time, but, you know, there's a lot of things that we do. But I want to concentrate on these last two. Big data, we could talk for hours and hours and hours about big data. But from a hospital side, this is the term that's used, the learning healthcare system. Um, we have so much uh, information, or actually I should say we have data that is stored in our hospital systems. And now that we're electronic throughout much of the country, we have just massive, massive, massive amounts of clinical data. But it's not information. If you take the most fundamental definition of, you know, information is meaningful data or data with meaning. If it's just a bunch of numbers on a page, you don't know if you're looking at, uh, you know, uh, uh, bank balances or football scores. You don't know what you're looking at. It has to have a context. And so you can imagine if we could figure out a way to tap all that individual patient data to be able to figure out, well, the patients that got this treatment fared better than the people that got this treatment. I mean, you could get answers a lot quicker than actually doing a, a two-year study trying to compare those things. Most of the, much of this is locked up. We haven't figured out the exact ways of, of sucking that information out. I think this is the future of healthcare because we have lots of data that's being put into so-called data warehouses. How do we get that out and make it useful for healthcare? And then finally, as Jaji mentioned, EHR safety, which is something I'm going to talk about a little bit more uh, as we go forward. Next, please. So, um, you know, I'm not going to belabor the point, but um, most of you are probably aware of the fact that uh, healthcare records, electronic healthcare records have been introduced, this, this multi-billion dollar incentive by the government was actually to improve care and to make things safer. And there's a variety of things as, as ridiculous as eliminating illegible handwriting, which again, <laughs> if you've ever read things written by doctors, you realize you have to practically pass it around the, you know, a committee to say, what was, what is this actually supposed to say? If that's a prescription, bad things can happen. You know, what was the drug? What was the dose? Did the doctor mean it in milligrams or grams? Or, you know, it gets really complicated and there have been major errors just because of that many fatal. Um, uh, we talked about, uh, you know, uh, doctors putting orders in computerized provider order entry, CPOE as it's often termed, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But there's a lot of things that allow, that, that will be allowed once we have electronic records, sharing data. I mean, I remember the days, uh, do, you know, patients coming in with this, you know, huge stack of files, or you'd request records from another doctor, and you'd get this big manila folder with all sorts of things in there, half the notes of which were illegible from you, you're requesting records, and you can't even read the records. Or patients that come in with these huge folders of x-rays under their arm, now you get a CD-ROM. It's actually, so it's completely different when you have a digitized record. And you can share things a lot more easily. Patients can look their data up on a portal. You can't do that in a paper world. You can do that in an electronic world. So there's a lot of empowerment for patients. Um, next, please. However, there's some things that can go wrong, so-called unintended consequences that have been written about where, where just things are wrong. Wrong information is entered on the wrong patient. Um, you know. Things like uh, you should have had an alert that something was wrong, the lab test was way out of whack, the patient was allergic to a medication and you just ordered it. So there's a lot of things potentially that can go wrong and there's a whole field that has studied these unintended consequences. And then you can have computer stuff that just you know, doesn't quite work and there's, another, there's a whole bunch of literature on where, where doctors and nurses become so dependent on the computer, if there truly is a computer foul up, they just sort of assume the computer is always right. And you override, well, the computer gave me alert, oh, it's, it probably doesn't mean that. You know, always dangerous. You know, pilots 
supposed to fly, you believe your instruments. I mean, oh, well, I know north is that way, and it's the compass must be off. It's like, no, north is that way. Uh, next, please. So the Joint Commission, on, on, uh, uh, our Joint Commission uh, is an organization that accredits hospitals, and they have been uh, looking at some stuff because it's been reported for a number of years. And I'm not going to belabor the point, but, but over a three-and-a-half-year period, they found 120 so-called sentinel events, bad things, patient death, loss of limb, paralysis, some really bad thing. And hospitals have to report this, otherwise you get into real big trouble if you don't. They found 120 of them that were related to health IT in some way. And I realize you can't read all, these, all of these uh, subcategories, but I'll tell you, these subcategories were invented by one of our faculty members, Dr. Dean Siddig, along with uh, his associate, Hardeep Singh, over at Houston VA Hospital. Uh, next, please. Um, the ONC realized we have a problem. They, one of the things they did was they commissioned this group, Dr. Siddig, Dr. Singh, and Joan Ash, who is in, in Oregon, to actually come up with so-called SAFER guides. And it's a fancy you know, acronym for what SAFER stands for. But it was really self-assessment guides. Hospital teams would sit down, go through them, and say, you know, these are the recommended practices. Are we doing this? And if you're not, you better think about maybe doing it or, you know, it's a known risk. You have to have a plan to deal with that. Next, please. So as I said, this was, the, this was the team. I was very fortunate to be doing my master's degree at a time where they were looking for somebody. I asked Dean, who was one of my faculty members, as was Dr. Cohen, Dr. Johnson, and uh, Dr. Murphy, of course, at the school. Um, but um, I asked Dean, you got any projects? And he said, just so happens I have one. So next slide, please. So it was to help develop the safer guides, which took into account um, all of these different factors, which I realize you can't read it, but this is Siddig and Singh, um, eight different socio-technical factors for what affects the ability to safely implement an electronic health record into the hospital. Again, hardware and software is just one of many components. If you don't take into account the people, the workflow, are there rules, or, you know, what is actually in there? Look at the interface. If the interface is so bad that the doctor can't actually realize what information is, is being uh, shown to that doctor, it's not very helpful. So this was the model that the Joint Commission had used to try to identify all those things that had gone wrong, and this was also the model that they used as a basis for the SAFER guides. Next slide, please. And so there's nine of these. These are freely available. This was developed by an ONC grant. You can, you can go to that website and just look them up. I was involved in, in working on this one, um, so have become very interested in all the things that can go wrong. Um, with, with doctors putting stuff into the computer and then getting support, clinical support back from the computer where the computer says, you know, they're allergic to that drug, you probably don't want to give that medicine. Or, you know, that drug is probably going to kill the patient because they're on another drug that's going to interact with it. And so, you know, back off and, you know, don't do that. So, uh, again, there's nine of these things. Uh, next slide, which I think is my, my yeah. Um, just to put this into perspective, the Joint Commission just in March, um, put out a safety alert, sentinel event safety alert, and they specifically mention use the safer guides in your hospital. So this has now been completely publicized nationwide, and I think this is my, my last slide, the next one. Um, we as an organization, HCA, which we have 160 plus hospitals, hard to keep track with all the mergers and acquisitions. Um, we have a lot of hospitals. One of the things we're trying to do is actually implement this across our entire company. And you may say, well, you know, don't you all use the same electronic record? And that's where the fallacy is. Every single hospital would have to do this because it's remarkable, the variations. You think you all have the same system. Somebody's tweaked it here. They've tweaked it there. They've turned something off. They've turned something on. It's remarkable, the variation. So we're going to be piloting this within our 13 hospitals in our region. Um, I worked on it. They said, you know, you should probably be the person who spearheads this. We're doing it uh, under the auspices of our patient safety organization, those of you in healthcare uh, know this is one of these umbrellas that allows you to, to, to safely share data and it's in a protected way because some of this potentially is very sensitive. You don't know what you're going to find until you, you do it and you find that, oops, we got a risk here, we need to fix this. Well, these are things you really, you don't like to air your dirty laundry in public. So these are things you want to be able to um, uh, satisfy the attorneys that this stuff is not going to be discoverable. And finally, if this is successful, 
we're going to roll this out across our entire enterprise. And again, I th we think that this will really go a very long way in terms of ensuring safety for our patients. And at the same time, be, I think, an endorsement for the Safer Guides when you have a very large healthcare organization that actually takes this upon itself to do this. And hopefully this will be an example for, for the rest of the, the hospitals in the nation. And I think that is my last slide. So, Jaji, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you very much.